everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning on our webinar on sustainability. Over the last few months and years, we had many conversations with customers and investors about how our buildings and operations can become more sustainable. Reducing the carbon emissions of our activity and advocating for supply chain to do the same is at the top of the agenda now. In the absence of the famous silver bullet, an incremental approach seems to be the only way forward. That means that everyone on the team every day will have a role to play in making us more sustainable. But how do we make sure that everyone on the team thinks sustainability when waking up in the morning? Stakeholder engagement is key as we believe that this is how results are achieved in the long term. During today's session, our experts will share insights on how we at GLP set the vision on sustainability and try to get all stakeholders involved to make our business more sustainable and reduce the carbon footprint of our portfolio. For those of you who don't know GLP, we are a global fund manager, investor and developer specialized in logistics. In Europe, we were formerly known under the name of Gaisley and we have a 30 year track record of developing and managing logistics space across the continent. Today in Europe, we are in 12 countries and manage close to 10 billion euros and a portfolio of 4.4 million square meters that's growing and a land bank that is, allows us to develop an additional 3.4 square meters. Before um, we dive into the topic, a few words on housekeeping. This webinar today is live and is meant to be interactive and you're invited to submit your questions in the uh, chat functionality on, uh, on your screen. And the panelists will try to respond to them probably at the end of the session. Um, to start the conversation uh, we, and, and test the tool, we would like to invite everyone to let us know from which city you are participating from today. Um, please type the name of your city into the polling functionality. Um, the panelists cannot enter the polling uh, functionality. So, so Graham Monroe, who's joining me today, he's uh, diving in from West Sussex. Philippa is based in Litchfield. And I'm based um, in Marseille, in France. So we see a few names coming up here. A lot around the Golden Triangle in the UK, but then also Spain, uh, Budapest, Prague, see Poland. Yeah, basically uh, an audience starting in from across the continent. So thank you everyone for, for joining us from so far away. That's the beauty about webinars. Uh, distance has disappeared. Um, uh, for good reasons, over the last 12 months, we've seen a, an acceleration of trends that started well before the pandemic. E-commerce penetration has increased by more than 25% in many countries. Uh, online shopping has become a part of everyday life and is here to stay. And driven by strong growth in the underpinned by structural long-term trends, logistics real estate has established itself as an asset class on its own. Investment volumes in Europe have reached record levels and investor appetite remains strong, fed by strong occupier demand and a structural shortage of supply. Uh, and in parallel to those strong market fundamentals, uh, ESG has become more and more important. Uh, the evidence for climate change and the need to reduce carbon emissions have become more and more urgent. urgent. Our, um, the top logistics occupiers have all set themselves ambitious sustainability goals and programs and they expect their supply chains to help them deliver those goals. And this is will be the topic of today's session uh, to discuss on how we can all get involved to reach um, those ambition, ambitious goals and re reduce the impact of our activities on, uh, on the environment. Um, before we jump to the presentation of our panelists. Another polling question uh, on engagement of your organization in ESG. Uh, please rate how your organization is currently engaged with ESG. One means not at all, five uh, quite a bit. I imagine that you personally are probably rather well engaged. Uh, you're present on this uh, session today. Um, and we'd be very curious to, to assess, to find out what your uh, involvement or your organization's involvement is. Streams to be quite strong engagement in many organizations. Who two is there? Yeah, it's quite evenly spread out. Yeah, but it seems to be that most organizations have a strong or very strong uh, buy in around ESG. So we look forward to seeing the questions and the uh, and the comments in the in the chat box that we will share towards the end of the uh, webinar. I'm Florian Vinuk, Head of Business Development Europe at GLP, and it's my pleasure to present two colleagues who spearhead GLP's ESG in Europe. 
Philippa Birchwood uh, from Chetwoods. Philippa, would you share a few words about your background with us, please? Yes, thank you, Florian. I'm Thrive Director at Chetwoods and Sustainability Champion for GLP. I'm a qualified architect, well-accredited professional and sustainability consultant whose key motive is to make sustainability simple for developer clients and construction professionals. Thank you, Philippa. Graham, you're Head of Construction Europe at GLP. A few words on your background, please. Yeah, sure, Florian. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Graham Rowe. Uh, I've got 20 years experience in logistics construction, uh, more or less at the technical and the execution level across a sort of pan-European role across the 12 countries for GLP, but mostly overseeing it at the forefront on the project execution level on ESG and also what we call core level, working with our asset management team, fund management team on GRES functionality and ESG reporting. So really all round at the, at the forefront of ESG. Okay, thank you, Graham. Well, to jump into the topic, uh, Philip and Graham, ESG is a very multidimensional uh, topic. Where do you start the journey to deliver results and make a meaningful impact? Okay, yeah. So first off, I think you need to find a common language. Um, obviously, GLP is a multinational company. And so therefore, um, we aligned GLP's value chain against the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And then by following that metric, um, we could then identify where the progress needs to be made, um, where, um, where there are areas for improvement, basically. Um, and then from that point on, we can make some clear goals. Um, and that, that's demonstrated in the um, ESG report. Um, you know, consumers are no longer satisfied with empty targets. Uh, we want to be taken along the journey too. And we hope that this ESG report really demonstrates that. I think, you know, to touch upon what Philip has said, I think we want to do the right thing as a business on transparency uh, for the business that's clear uh, for everybody to see. I think, you know, we've always led at GLP Gaisley over the years on sustainability framework and the credentials that that involves. But I think what's happened over the last sort of year, two years, is ESG is beginning to formalise a little bit now and, and uh, become into a bit of a framework that everybody's starting to recognise the importance of GRES and the ESG especially at the forefront and really just sort of recognising what that involves. And I think, you know, you have to be able to walk through that with investors and you have to make sure that the assets, I think, from a portfolio point of view, are not going to be stranded assets uh, in the future. What do I mean by stranded assets? I mean, obviously, making sure that the ESG focus is remaining within those assets and CapEx is invested in them. I think as a developer, your assets are obviously your most important tool uh, and making sure that the, the buildings are efficient and actually uh, running correctly. So really important to invest CapEx at the ESG focus level on the standing assets and stabilized assets as well. I think, you know, we recognize it's absolutely critical on the ESG path, whether it's on new build or existing portfolio management. So huge focus on both areas, I would say, our side. And our ESG report sort of points to that uh, this year uh, that we've just sort of reported on. And it focuses on 2020, obviously, our activities, but it also looks ahead a little bit at 2021 of what's got in store from ourselves at GLP. I think, uh, you know, moving on, I think the context of sustainability, ESG, I think, as a topic across is, is it involves obviously all stakeholders, what we're trying to say. I think it's all very well as a company, you know, having a vision, but I think you need to be able to turn that vision into reality and meaningful message. I think that's probably the challenge that we are facing uh, ourselves, and that's what we're up against. I think, we, as we said, we've touched upon, we've got 12 countries now in our, in our business set, and that's going to continue to grow. Uh, but managing to keep that message consistent throughout is definitely the main challenge uh, across the 12 countries. I think we recognize that you have to be able to adapt that at local market levels, and it needs to remain relevant to that market and country and the culture uh, within that and characteristics of it. So it's about creating a, you know, the overarching message is what we see at, at core level at my end, and then being able to create this generic modeling and concepts to be able to drive it at country level. And I think you know, 12 countries... 12 cultures, as I said, it's, you know, 12 different supply chains, really different ways in the way that they interact. And that's why we say there's no silver bullet in ESG messaging at country level. But there's a way that you can shape it and form it. There's a lot of push-pull factors to every country. But I think what's important as well is to remain flexible and adaptable. 
And obviously, I think one of the big things that I've definitely taken away from ESG in the last year has been open mind, open mindedness. It's really quite important that you remain uh, open minded in all these aspects. And uh, yeah, and we're going to cover some of this in the detail later on. So there's definitely a lot of push pull factors as well. Say in, uh, in the challenge of ESG. Well, logistics is by definition uh, an international business, and we have seen that the sector has grown in scale. In scale, how do you implement sustainability uh, sustainability across borders? Yeah, I think Floyd, really, really good question. I think I've sort of touched upon we're in twelve countries. I think what you see on the screen here is just a snapshot pie chart of our construction activity uh, at the end of February. This changes on a daily basis. You know, we have entered as a business Belgium in the last months. Uh, Italy, we're really starting to get traction. Central Eastern Europe, uh, we picked up upon last year uh, in the Goodman portfolio acquisition. So there's a, there's, there's a lot of activity, is what I'm trying to say, I suppose, within our sector, but especially within GLP. We've got a lot going on on the imminent or live project side. And this is just a snapshot of kind of the, you know, where the market is on our side at the moment or where we are actively busy live on projects, uh, physically on construction with ESG focus. I think really that's the challenge, right? You've got 12 countries here, uh, 10 on the screen and sort of two others that, that we're looking at, or Belgium, as I said, and, and a few others. So I think, you know, we have to take a bit of a different approach in Europe compared to GLP, what I say GLP global. Uh, we've got China, Japan, South America, and India. That's a different market. It's a different, it's a different characteristics from what we see in Europe. I think we all know in Europe that the characteristics are similar in a lot of the, the countries within Europe. But the cultures are quite different and the mar market characteristics are very different, I think, uh, when you go from UK to Germany, for example, on the marketplace. So we're well aware of that, but really making sure that the message is kept consistent is what we're trying to say on the ESG right across these borders. And I think uh, so when we see this, you know, the snapshot of what I'm showing there is really 28, you know, at the end of February, we had 28 live on-stream projects where they're coming to fruition or on-site. So it's quite a lot to manage, I think, generally. But the key point is, is that there's different projects within there. There's, you know, a lot of speculative projects nowadays, uh, built to suit projects, obviously, coming up behind that. We've got forward funded projects. We've got portfolio buyouts. We've got CapEx investment on the asset management side and, and stabilized assets. So all that together, I think, you know, it needs to be coherent in terms of the ESG message. And really, that's where the challenge lies, really, from our side, is what we're trying to say. Thank you. Uh, Greg, sustainability as a concept has been around for quite some time now. Uh, what has the journey been so far and what has it changed over all those years? Yeah, I think really sort of poignant question on our side. I think if you walk through, I'm going to walk you through this timeline of where we've sort of taken the journey on our, our ESG journey as such. I think if you look back at 2003, you know, the revolu revol revolution of the building of what an eco template could look like in terms of ESG messaging and concepts. I think that sort of moved on, you know, a bit of a pause there and thoughts on, you know, how that could look. And in 2008 in Stoke, we delivered on Chatterley Valley Warehouse in UK, um, a project that was sort of way ahead of its time as Briam, first Briam outstanding building, very much looking at the materials in the building and the design uh, criteria within it. And then fast forward to sort of 2013, we were in China as well, active as Gaisley, and we were very much looking at renewables and the renewable energy concept and what that all entailed uh, within it. And then in 2014, fast forward to there, I think it was also about ESG, but with a messaging on delivering quality at the same time, but also delivering fast track construction and how this can all be interwoven together uh, as ESG messaging and quality and control of a project for customers. I think then you move that on to 2017, we started to look at the route to net zero and the route to net zero for me back then was about really about the health and well-being. We're seeing a lot of things in the press about the green and the well-being space within the warehouses. A lot to do with, I think, if you remember on documentaries, et cetera, of, you know, the workplace and the environment for the staff and conditions within there. So we really focusing on the green credentials was 2017. And then, you know, back up to, you know, last year, 2020, where were we? I think if we touch upon some of the UK projects we launched as pilot projects uh, with Stephen Alexander, our construction director in UK, really spearheading, um, you know, net zero, achieving net zero and magnitude building, the sort of world's first to be recognised 
UK Green Building Council uh, to be real net zero certified, looking at smart lighting within the building, the efficiencies of how that could be used, how the building's operating, looking at life cycle carbon assessments and measuring your carbon data capture, uh, really, really key, I think, in terms of that. And then if we fast forward, I think, to 2021, uh, where are we today? Well, I think, you know, today it, it moves on again and it, it seems to move on every couple of uh, years, but I think it's coming down to years rather than waiting a few years now. I think within GLP and Van Rye in Netherlands, we're looking at really the, the, the first circular economy um, warehouse certified. It'll be the first logistics centre to be circular certified. And it's really looking at all the credentials, but what it's looking at is a gasless warehouse. So no gas being used in the warehouse. I think that's going to be a focus. Also looking at the, the circular economy. Uh, we talk about you know the recycling of materials, the passport of materials Philip was going to touch upon and really how the, how the building, the evolution of a building can be recycled as a, as a logistics center. And I think that's really important, you know, bringing this all together really is, is sort of where it's at. And, you know, one space for cohesion for everything sort of going on. And we're, we're able to sort of deliver on this with our, our sort of guides that we, that we do. And one of the, cu the questions I always get asked from customers is about being the employer of choice for our buildings. So I think, and you know, to be the employer of choice, you have to be able to answer all these ESG credentials as well, but also feature some of them as well, depending on how the customer uh, wants to feature that. But I think as a baseline, we want to have that. So huge focus, I will say, on the circular economy, eco passport materials. And, you know, we're able to demonstrate through that some of our guys that we're going to talk about. But sustainability remains key and everything around the sort of ESG messaging tends to deliver on, on the buildings that we deliver today. Sounds like the approach to, to sustainability has become more and more holistic and systematic. Um, based on this track record, what principles have you identified as a solid so, uh, foundation for a, for a robust uh, ESG strategy, Brian? Yeah, I think, you know, good question, Florian. I think, you know, I'm confident if you look at these sort of five points on the screen of what we've said, I think it's important to remain focused to this as a business. I think, you know, invest responsibly. I think, you know, that's one of the key things. I think that's one of the things that GLP we've always sort of managed to do, but also doing the right thing as a business has always been at the forefront from our side. And I think, you know, develop and manage sustainable assets. I think we talk about, I've talked about today about stranded assets. We don't want our assets to be, to be non-investable. You know, we want to have an interest in our assets and it's about creating the efficiencies within them. So making sure that the sustainability credentials are around your buildings of the future, but also on the stabilized asset side. And I think one of the things that logistics has always been pretty good at, I think over the last years has been the efficiencies, right? From the customer through to developers, the efficiencies have always been key, whether specification or enhancing value. So a lot of these things are, are really still very important today to deliver on. Uh, especially, I think, where we that sort of move on to is to understand the efficiencies of the building and how it's operating. And we are able to demonstrate that through our smart lighting that sort of, manages all the movement within the building. We can understand how the building's actually being used in real time, why? Uh, and I think, you know, govern ethically and transparency. I think the ESG is talked about, the G being the governance and the, you know, the, the, the policy side of things. So I think that really formalizes it through our ESG report. And that's what we need to deliver for, for our investors as well as transparency. And, you know, new policies being put in place towards the ESG uh, and sort of driving that through every part of the business is, is absolutely key. And I think, you know, one thing that definitely coming out during COVID, uh, you know, definitely my side, still top of the agenda is going to be well-being, right? So I think, you know, coming out the back, back of COVID, hopefully, as I say, coming out the back of it, then I think well-being is going to be still very top, much top of the agenda. And we really focus on that on our buildings. And we try to provide to everybody the rationale between our design and how that's linked the ESG. So there's a lot of thinking goes into the materials and the look and the feel of how we deliver our buildings. Uh, and I think that's key, really. And obviously, one and last important thing is probably quality. I think we, we stand by our quality and we do, as we say, as it is on the tin. We deliver on quality and we deliver on time. That, that, that continues to be important for customers. Okay, thank you. So what are the, the focus areas, uh, Philippa, maybe on uh, for ESG in logistics? 
Yeah, so as I said earlier, um, GLP's value chain is mapped against the UN Sustainable De Development Goals. And in doing this, we could highlight key areas of impact, some which uh, Graham has already touched upon. So obviously we've got the race to net zero carbon, obviously in order to limit warming to 1.5 degrees C and avoid runaway climate change. That means that all new buildings need to be net zero carbon by 2030 and all existing buildings need to be net zero carbon by 2050. Um, so that's obviously a key theme that we need to focus on going forward and we're going to discuss that topic much further later. Um, and then obviously Graham suggested um, obviously health and well-being is obviously another massive area and um, it's only going to be incre increased in importance as we go forward when we go back um, post pandemic. Then we've also got biodiversity. Um, you know, we're not only just facing a climate emergency, but an ecological one. We need to protect, protect the complex ecosystems on, upon which we rely for our food and our health. And this, this is recognised in the UK Environment Bill, which is being reviewed again this year. And we're expecting that um, a 10% biodiversity net gain will be expected across all development sites going forward and I suspect that that ethos will all, all spread across other countries as well and then we've also got wider social values so developments not only affect the end user but wider society and developers are starting to recognize that um, and so that's again another area for focus um, and those those three last topics we will be picking up on in another webinar. I think, you know, what focus, uh, what Philippa focuses on there, they're all important points. We're currently shaping this through our EX, ESG execution strategy for 21 and beyond. Uh, I think today we're focusing on, on net zero carbon that Philip is going to touch on a bit more and how we deliver that. Okay, so these are the principles. How do you set out to, to go from these principles to, to concrete action, uh, Philippa, please? Yeah, okay, so... First of all, um, we need to set a baseline. So as, as we said before, you know, start with what you know, um, understand what's being do done currently as a norm. And from that point onwards, um, we can then then go further. So this, this, oh, go back. Um, so once we've got that baseline, um, we can then work with wider stakeholders to reduce embodied carbon, reduce operational carbon, incorporate more healthy design principles to improve occupier well-being and improve more sustainable or incorporate more sustainable materials or construction methodologies to improve the circularity of developments. I think, you know, what Philip has touched upon here is we're not really promoting what I say is rocket science. Uh, it's quite logical what we talk about. It's about stripping it back to basics, understanding what it means in context and delivery to embed in all parts of the, the build process and the concept of ESG and sustainability in the focus point. And I think, you know, for my personal liking is that I don't like to overcomplicate things. I think it's important that everybody within the supply chain, investors, customers, understand how you follow that process. And it's very logical. But take it back to basics so that everybody can actually physically understand it and walk, walk through it with you on that journey. And I think if you do that and bring everybody on the journey with you of what you're trying to achieve, and everybody starts to understand what about the bigger picture of ESG is within the deliverables, then you know you'll have the backing of everybody to to do, to do more as well. And I think sort of moving on here, I think in terms of the the baseline, I think Philippa, you want to maybe talk about the baseline and how we set it. That's... Yeah, exactly. So um, through conducting um, life cycle analysis assessments, um, we can then um, obviously identify what that baseline is. And um, GLP did that with Doncaster back in 2019. Um, and you can see the breakdown of materials and how they have an impact here. Um, with logistics, it's quite an unusual scenario where actually, you know, almost 70% of the, um, the carbon emissions come from embodied carbon. So that's why we're really, really focusing on the embodied carbon side. And you can see already there's an improvement from Doncaster to magnitude. And if we go to the next slide, you can actually see um, a bar chart that shows the reductions a little bit more clearly here, comparing from a baseline um, to the actual for Doncaster and the actual for magnitude. And you can see that we've actually, as a baseline, GLP has still got, you know, almost 12% 
um, improvement compared to a baseline. And then magnitude was, you know, another, you know, 25% reduction on the baseline. So we're hoping to drive down these, you know, little charts <laughs> and see an improvement from one building to another. And I think, you know, we're all aware as well that it's, you know, there's not one answer to all of this. It's, it's, we know that you'll get to a point you can only improve upon. So I think it's, it's really looking at all that. But uh, to move on, I think in terms of the ESG concept, I wanted to visualize a baseline offering to our customers. And we did this with uh, Chetwoods, uh, with Philippa and our team to really create a virtual infographic as a walkthrough guide. I think it really sort of forms the basis of a conversation with our customers uh, and also investors to show really what the vision is and towards the ESG focus and what our offering is as a, as what we call as a baseline offering. Uh, I think it's much easier to see in pictures, as we all know, rather than go through a million manuals. I think this, this sort of infographic is able to depict that very easily and quickly for MD to pick it up and get a base understanding of what ESG is about within the basis of our design and our ESG concept in the, the technical specification and where we're aiming at with it. So it gives you a real handling for somebody that's non-ESG focused, whether it's you know somebody that's going to make a financial decision about taking a building or whatever. It gives them a very good handling of what ESG is about in terms of what our baseline is at GLP on it. But it's also a generic building, uh, is what I would say. It's a generic building, and what we start to do is start to carve this towards each country and the market conditions within it. So it's a generic building that's then carved to suit uh, local markets and conditions, but it's a starting point as a, as a thought process of what ESG can look like and features within the building. Yeah, so obviously after setting a baseline, um, we then look into what we can do at design stage. Um, and as GLP have worked to set a clear and robust vision aligned with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, it makes it much easier for stakeholders to understand their position. And in doing this, GLP enable their consultants to have a voice and bring new innovations to the table. GLP are in a position to make significant positive changes through their specifications as they are, they are efficient and can be applied to multiple buildings, unlike in other sectors. Um, GLP are at a point where there is no silver bullet for sustainability, as we've mentioned a couple of times so far. The obvious easy wins have been won and therefore every detail is important. To that end, we have regular workshops to establish the new eco template for GLP including the design team, subcontractors, suppliers and research bodies. And the outcomes from these workshops feed into the specification. I think, you know, what Philip is really high, highlighting there, I think from my side on the, the technical side, is that it's so important to embed ESG at the very start of a process. And especially with the supply chain, the supply chain can really influence as to what you feature within your building. So really important to have the buy-in and the understanding from the supply chain in the execution of a project from the virtual team, you know, virtual team of consultants, designers, general contractors, suppliers, all of that feeds in to the general contractor delivering a building. And that's where the key where we see the, the focus has to remain at the very start of acquiring a site. I think, you know, we've, created some tools as I've sort of highlighted uh, in the previous slides, but I think some of the things I'm gonna talk about here is a European design guide. Uh, it's a generic offering, it's, it's very easy to understand, but we constantly review our specifications, I would say twice a year. Why do we do it twice a year? We do it to remain current in the marketplace and making sure that we've picked up on any market changes, characteristics that's happened, but also remains very current and towards the ESG factor. But what you see in our European Design Guide is it's, there's a thought process in there from ourselves. We're very transparent on it. Uh, we, we explain where the ESG fits in on certain materials. And we start talking about eco-passports, G, G passports, we've called them. But really looking at the materials within the building and how that all features within the building and why we've used specific materials in our buildings, uh, how that's all linked. And I think, you know, the baseline offering really sort of details as to what, what we'd be able to give you on ESG. And we're able to carve that, obviously, to every customer's needs and tweak it up or tweak it down uh, as to how they like. But I think what it gives you is a walkthrough guide with an ESG sustainability focus 
uh, that we'll, we'll thought through. And it's a generic concept that we can cut and carve to every country. I think the specification over the years for ourselves is probably the most powerful tool that we have. It's been tweaked and tweaked uh, with years of experience and trials and industry research. So I always say to my guys that they're only as good as the last project. So I think it's, it's really important that we, we sort of keep that current and keep it very up to the, to the, the most uh, recent uh, technology that's available on the market. And that's why we constantly review on the ESG front uh, on the technical specification side. Yeah. And in asking those questions for the G passport, it's obviously setting a baseline for materials to be able to contrast um, and compare much easier than perhaps looking through different formats of environmental performance state declarations. Um, it means that GLP, uh, you know, in asking those questions, are hopefully sending ripples out throughout the uh, construction industry to help suppliers to be more transparent as well. Um, so, you know, it's really about using our position um, to encourage others along the same journey. So then obviously we move on to construction stage and this starts with the pre-qualification pre questions asked at the tender stage. Um, so once again, it's all about the questions asked to the supply chain. Once the preferred contractor is selected, check with Thrive Act to sustainability champions collating data to evidence that the vision has been adopted. Sustainability is the first item on the agenda at the pre-start meeting, and we lead a one-hour segment with the Planet Mark and Circular Ecology, who's the um, life cycle analysis consultant, to remind the construction team of the purpose and table further potential um, on-site reduction measures. And then once all possible reductions are made, we expect to get Brianne very good at an absolute minimum and the carbon footprint of our developments are measured to get a true picture of the impact of the scheme. And these figures are tracked for comparison. I think, you know, what, to add to what Philip is saying, it's crucial that the hard work sort of brought from the previous projects and builds experience, eco template workshops and there's sort of learn for the, the projects going forward. So. There's a huge sort of translation into quality logistics uh, delivering on the facility and very much the vision from our side that is embedded in the design team to really focus on how to move things forward on ESG at construction stage. So yeah, it can't be evidence that GLP walk the talk without some tools to capture data. We have helped GLP to create their project sustainability information or PSI document. This report shares the sustainability story of the development and the contractor helps to tell that story by filling in the gaps. It captures all of the facets of sustainability, you know, a holistic picture in one place for GLP marketing, for the customer and for the contractor. One of the many elements that will be logged in this document is any trial that, is, that has been made um, on the project. The pre-start meeting is a perfect opportunity to table any ideas that have resulted from the eco template workshops. And I think what Philip is really saying there is really important. This is where I go back to the supply chain again. Absolutely critical that they're on board with all of this, that the data capture is the key part for us. Data capture is everything to be able to learn to go forward on projects uh, across Europe. And one of the, the sort of sort of thinking out the box, small wins, I would say, is in the UK, uh, we've seen a concept, uh, Stephen, uh, construction director of UK, on granulized recycled rubber, uh, you know, used on AstroTurf on football pitches across Europe. I think uh, what we're starting to do now is thinking outside the box. We've used granulized uh, recycled rubber from old tiles in our asphalt. Uh, on some products on estate roads. I think that just, uh, it's a great initiative. It, it makes sense, you know, they use it on AstroTurf, why not use it in asphalt, uh, recycled rubber? But it's a great point towards, I think, again, circular economy and the concept of what ESG is about, uh, recycling material. I think, as I've said earlier, the importance of this circular economy thinking uh, and everything that we do towards the ESG I think that's exactly what it is in asset management. Uh, I'm going to touch upon sort of proactive asset management and the reinvestment of capex uh, on ESG topics and older assets. Uh, as I said, it's not always about looking forward on the new projects, but very important to go back and look at your older 
portfolio to make sure that they don't become stranded assets, as we've said, and really bring them up to efficiency uh, within the 21st century. I think, you know, for example, I think we've, there's prime examples within our business, you know, in France, we're going through quite a significant rollout just now with our asset management colleagues, uh, focusing on LED replacement and older portfolio, right through to increase the efficiencies in the buildings. Uh, but I think we can also point towards, uh, you know, vacant buildings. When there's any vacant buildings coming up in our portfolio, we're sig investing significant capex back into them. Looking at various items in terms of, you know, the, the heating and ventilation systems, efficiencies, looking at green gases uh, in terms of the quality of what we'd be reinstalling there. I think huge important to look at towards electric uh, vehicles, charging, how does that all function in older assets, having the facility to be able to cater for that. And again, you know, pointing towards the well-being of the staff, the, the layouts, the office structure, the, the breakout areas, you know, what can we do there to make a difference, to really bring these older assets up as to how we see a building today look and feel. So for me, there's a lot can be done on the, the older assets as well that really can bring them up to, to today's market, to be honest. And I think one of the sort of key projects on that that we're, we're working on just now is a project called Sun. Uh, it's our vision at GLP to deliver photovoltaic across all our buildings, but from ourselves as an energy company. Uh, so not forward, not funded from others, third parties. Uh, we're able to offer it all in-house, size the PV to the customer's requirements and build that PV and deliver it all in-house. Uh, that's quite a unique concept. We've done it across uh, China and Japan, and we're looking at now focusing within this in Europe. It's not so straightforward in Europe because every country has its own jurisdiction, own laws, own tax, et cetera. So uh, very much the PV market, photovoltaic market in Europe is very different uh, across every country. So we're, we're, we're definitely moving forward with that. Uh, Netherlands sort of leading the way with UK on some projects that we're doing just now and uh, hope to have that live sort of latter part of this year on Netherlands and the UK uh, for our customers being able to deliver PV. So. There's a lot of focus on this for the next, definitely the next five years. I think every building will be looking at having sort of portable take where possible, shall we say, within the markets and within Europe and a tenant desire to do so as well to become green energy. So now we're just going to reflect on a couple of case studies um, that we picked up on earlier in the timeline. Um, so, yeah, as we saw previously, there are two recent case studies which further demonstrate the continual self-improvement at GLP, one of which is Benrai, which is due to be certified as a circular building in the Netherlands. The project team have acted in accordance with the RVO, which is the Dutch Authority for Businesses, um, and, and their requirements. It is an, an initiative which is still evolving. Um, assessment method is not yet fully clear. However, GLP are wanting to steer from the front and test the options. I think, you know, what, what Philip is really referring to there is the data capture of the circular economy, the recycling of materials within data capture, comparing it against the government model uh, of the Netherlands. So, again, this data capture within ESG remains very poignant. And I think what you see on this is a, the CGI here is it's really about bringing that, I suppose, that vision to reality and delivering upon it and really advocating the quality and, uh, you know, delivery of what we can do with our ESG credentials. I think obviously you can see a bit of a green, greenery on the outside towards the office spec. So focusing even on, you know, the entrance area coming into the building. So I think there's a lot to do in market desires of how ESG should look and feel on a building. And I think we're starting to kick that in into our specification across Europe with uh, this building here, which is sort of cutting edge in terms of the circular economy uh, certification. Yeah. So um, in order to be considered as a circular building, the scheme must meet eight criteria stipulated by the RVO. And these criteria include requirements for the use of recycled or reusable materials, um, minimum environmental performance and a secure web based materials passport, which is cutting edge. And I believe that's all through using Modasta as a, as a platform. All details will be made public by the Netherlands Enterprise Agency at the end. So it's really an open source um, process um, and it's about sharing that knowledge that the GLP have been through. 
And I think what Philip has touched upon there is this this passport of materials that we keep talking about. It's important to capture the data of the passport of materials within the building that are being used, um, and that's compared against the government, as, as Philip has highlighted. And I think, you know, really important that this circular certification concept of recycling materials itself it highlights the importance of the, the materials within the building. But I think one of the key features on this building for me was that there's no gas in the building. That's another step forward. Uh, and I think we're starting to see it in our homes coming in now as well, the, the moving out of gas towards gas, uh, heat, ground source heat pumps, etc. So this building's using underfloor heating and it's also in the warehouse towards the main traffic areas and also in the office areas as well. So very forward thinking, like a new build house, uh, you have to think of your logistics center on basically EPC certification, obviously extremely efficient, and the ESG credentials on the circular economy of passport materials. And another case study, which was very lucky to be involved with. Um, so this is Magnitude 314 in Milton Keynes, um, and it was the world's first building ever to be verified as net zero carbon for construction in line with the UK Green Building Council framework definition. And if we go to the next slide, I can talk through the process that GLP followed. So um, obviously by using the, the framework um, as a main sort of guidance, um, we followed these six methods. So um, there was number one, which is the method. So what, what is the method of calculating net zero carbon? Then we looked at modeling. So modeling the differences to identify where this carbon savings could be made. Then we have monitoring. Um, which what we use the um, PSI document for to, to gather those metrics and then measure at the end. So um, conduct life cycle analysis to identify what the actual carbon footprint of the building is. Then we look to mitigation as a last resort and offset through a verified scheme in line with the framework. And then obviously the idea is that, you know, at stage six, we can advocate that the occupiers of that building continue that vision in the actual running of the building. I think you were really, to add to what Philip has touched upon here, is about creating a really desirable logistics centre with huge ESG credentials attached to it. Uh, I think, you know, the building looks great. Uh, I've seen it in person and the efficiencies are great. So to be honest, what's not to like? Yes, indeed. So thank you, Philippa and Graham. This is definitely a lot of food for thought. Um, before we go to the final chapter of our um, of our webinar, maybe a, a question to the audience. Which of these initiatives are you going to carry forward to your own businesses? Uh, it might look like a quiz, but it's not. It's, it's just curiosity what you have uh, found the most interesting here. So while we're waiting for the answers. Yeah, I think, you know, carbon life cycle assessments, uh, you know, the embodied carbon is massive on the construction side, Florian. So I would expect that moving forward, what I expect to see in the marketplace is that the, the life cycle assessment is going to be absolutely key in capturing the data and to understand how the buildings are, how the buildings are operating. So interesting to see what, what comes out of this, this overview here. Uh, Great. Seems to be undecided. So I'm moving up. It looks as if, uh, yeah, moving around a little bit, but equal, I think, on life cycle carbon assessment and workshops on site. And obviously workshops on site can be translated across different businesses, depending on what your site is. Um, yeah, interesting results. Okay, so for those who are undecided, um, this webinar will be live on our website. So if you want to watch it again or recommend it to a colleague or a friend who missed it. Um, as I said, we're coming to the end, towards the end of the session. Graham, um, after everything that has been done and tested, what's next for GLP in terms of ESG, please? Yeah, sure. I think, uh, you know, in terms of uh, GLP, well, we don't rest on our morals, as you know. We're always moving forward, never, never standing still. Uh, really, really important, I think, for us. We've done a lot this year on it as well. The global framework has been set at policy level right across the global uh, GLP network. I think we've then carved a European policy uh, with Natalie Cooper of our asset head of asset management, uh, really carving that right through the business uh, to all aspects and bringing that right down into project level. And then really formalization of a ESG committee 
And so having people, what we call the task force within the business, and that's not just people from development or uh, construction, that's people right through other departments, HR, legal, compliance, uh, finance, fund management, et cetera. So really they're involved with that task force and initiatives for the business to really drive it forward uh, on concepts that can be carried at project level. And I think, you know, really focus on the, the fund side and the finance side on green leasing. I think that's going to be a greenhouse gases, uh, bonds, et cetera. That's going to be a big focus at the moment for our teams. And I think general energy, you know, reduction needs to be the key overall. Uh, what we've also been busy with, uh, I've been busy with, with Natalie Cooper, uh, Head of Asset Management, is an ESG portal. We've built an ESG portal. We've talked about data capture today, capturing all of data. Uh, we've, we've, we've basically built one bespoke to GLP uh, to capture all data running live uh, now, basically, for all our asset managers and developers. And I think, you know, hugely important, I think, the GRES submission for us. Um, we report to investors. Uh, we've got an obligation to report to GRESB and we want to be transparent, as we said. So I think huge focus on what we can do better at GRESB uh, reporting level uh, and how we can get ESG messaging there. Obviously, a, a point to that is obviously our ESG report uh, that we're publishing just now. And you know, we're able to detail through that as to really a capture, a snapshot of the year as to how we've delivered on our ESG right through the business on the environmental, social and the government side. And really looking forward again to 2021. And then I think, you know, really from another point of view, we've looked at it from is a quarterly touch point, uh, really with our, our marketing team, our customer feedback, and also for investors as well. I think really newsletter updates and what we're doing, because there's a lot of projects running, let's be honest, uh, I will side on ESG and lots of things changing every few months. So we've got a bit of a touch point of a newsletter on the ESG side and what we're doing. I think he knows about our bees and our, our, our G hive. So uh, we're, we're still continuing on that front as well. So yeah, lots more to come from us at, at GLP on the ESG front. Okay, thank you, Graham and Philippa. This is the moment um, to ask questions. During the session, I've seen uh, a few questions come through uh, around data monitoring and measuring of emissions. I don't know. I know you touched upon this already, Graham, during your presentation. But maybe you want to, uh, to. I mean, conscious of time, we we're yeah. almost towards the end of the session. But maybe you want to touch upon this a little bit: how we measure carbon emissions and how we want to capture data. Yeah, I think you know the passport. We've talked about the eco passport, the data capture. I think really important to be able to log your, your you know utility readings, consumption data of the customers. We know that the customers sometimes don't want to be open on that. I think it's important in the leases that, uh, that that's all touched upon, that we can get access to that sort of data where possible. I think the ESG, the data capture is critical. How to do that, you know, how to formalize it across a, a business that's run in 12 countries is quite a task. Uh, but we, we created a bespoke system to ourselves that all the asset managers have access to. And all our initiatives as we continue on our ESG journey are logged into that database. So there's a lot to do there uh, in terms of being able to take the, the, the database further, shall we say, and not just utility consumption. So it has every initiative that's agreed and executed at asset level within it. So we're able to draw comparisons very quickly uh, across the countries and what, where we're actually live with different initiatives. I think it's about data capture at key gateways as well to really identify where the data is going to have an impact. Um, so obviously we talked about um, collecting data at, um, at construction stage at PC, um, but obviously trying to collect data uh, during occupancy so it then can be fed back into um, into the design process. Um, so yeah, I think, I think doing well on that front, but obviously it's it's a moving feast. <laughs> the more data you can capture, the better. Okay, thank you. Well, with this, we come to the end of our webinar. Thank you, Philippa and Graham, uh, for being on our panel today. Um, thank you uh, for our participants for diving in today on for, for your interest. Once more, a, a recording of this webinar will be available on our website. If you have any questions to uh, the panelists, please don't hesitate to reach out uh, directly. Um, if you enjoyed this webinar, we have a, a follow-up in April, on April 23rd. Please note this webinar will be on the S in ESG, foc focusing on social sustainability in logistics real estate. Uh, 
we hope to see you there. Thank you everyone for joining and please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any topics that you wish to discuss further with the, the panelists. Thank you everyone and bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye.